topsy-turvy story of Miami in terms of development. And I've uh, put together some notes on this, and I want to look at several boom-bust periods in Miami history. Uh, Miami's very young as cities go, and yet it's a very, very important, a very famous place. It was only incorporated in 1896. In fact, as late as 1895, there were just nine people living along both banks of the Miami River near its mouth. So things have changed dramatically, obviously, uh, in the last 119 years. And it's undergone a series of spectacular booms and busts in that period, uh, which really, I think, sets it apart from a lot of other parts of the United States. And these extremes in Miami's economic cycle, as I see it, were triggered by several factors. One was the dominant position of tourism in the city and county's economy. Another was the creation of new land through Everglades drainage and subsequent drainage programs. Another were population explosions. Another was national prosperity and national economic downturns. Another factor, I think, in the boom and bust cycles of Miami, foreign investment. Another, wartime exposure, especially World War II. Another, very strong and oftentimes very engaging and creative promotion. And I wanted to look then, looking at those factors behind uh, booms and busts in Miami's economy, primarily real estate, I wanted to look at some of the eras then that have exhibited these boom-bust cycles. And 1896 to 1920, as I see it, is from nowhere to somewhere pretty quickly. Miami, or at least the area along the Miami River near its mouth, as I mentioned before, was tiny. 1895-90. The following year, Henry Flagg's Railroad entered Miami, the Florida East Coast Railway, and just opened up everything, April 13, 1896. And changed forever, really, the destiny of this area. In the 1910s, which was less than 20 years after the railroad entered, and a little bit more than 20 years after the railroad entered Miami, uh, Miami experienced um, a population boom that uh, marked the highest percentage growth of any city in the United States, over 400% growth between 1910 and 1920. And it was accompanied by what, by today's standards, would be a small boom. But the boom really centered around the construction of the sky. Uh, this guy uh, built by James Daring, the Palazzo itself between 1914 and 1916, uh, engaged 10% of Miami's population, not workforce, but population, as a workforce. And then that really kind of set the stage, I think, for the 1920s. So here's a city growing faster than any other city in the United States in terms of per capita growth. And in the 1920s, Miami hit a spectacular real estate boom that reached its peak in the late summer of 1925. And it really transformed Miami from a young community, as I see it, still close to its frontier origins, into an emerging metropolitan area. The predictable downturn, the bust, which diffused the boom in 1926, was exacerbated by a mighty hurricane that smashed into the area on September 17, September 18, 1926, and just worsened what was already a severe downturn. And it really heralded uh, the onset of about a decade of economic funk for the greater Miami area. But the boom of that era, that reached its peak in 1925, late summer 25, and began a few years before that, was probably the most talked about development in the young city's history, at least up until World War II. Everybody referenced the boom. Uh, some of its characteristics, the boom in the mid-20s, it made multi-millionaires out of developers like George Merrick of Carl Gables and Carl Fisher of Miami Beach. It brought us the Binder Boys, these professional speculators coming out of the northeastern United States, seeing an opportunity in this craziness with the spiraling prices of land uh, to make some money. It created our first suburbia. Of course, today these would be almost like in-town neighborhoods, but then considered suburbs. It built our first skyline along Biscayne Boulevard. It put us in the national limelight for the first time. So many people are covering it through our cover stories in national magazines about the Florida boom, specifically the Miami boom. It made speculators out of average persons. I remember one time I was writing an article on this eons ago, I interviewed a friend of mine's father, who was an elderly gentleman at the time, where he an attorney, and I said, and he lived in Miami in the 20s, and I said, did you know about the Binder Boys? He said, I was a Binder Boy. I was 18 and I was buying and selling real estate in Flagler Street in downtown Miami. And he said, everybody else I know was a buyer boy too. It was a way to make money quickly. 
It gave us fantasy figures that boom in the mid-20s did. Uh, for example, American fishers reported wealth. Uh, America on paper was worth somewhere between 75 and 100 million dollars, according to several sources. Carl Fisher probably closer to 75 million dollars in that year, 1925. It also gave us colossal types of sizes. The Miami Herald, for example, contained more advertising print than any other newspaper in the world in 1925. And it was average in daily 88 pages. And Sunday went way over that. And then there was another newspaper, even older, the Miami Daily News of Metropolis, that's what it's called, 1925. They put out a special edition because when they finished what today we would call the Miami News Freedom Tower on Biscayne Boulevard between 6 and 7, at 279 feet, that was the tallest building south of Atlanta. So they wanted to put out a special newspaper on Miami's birthday to kind of emphasize the fact that this place had really grown. The newspaper contained 504 pages. Sales figures for Carl Gables, another part of those kind of fantasy figures with the boom in the mid-20s. Carl Gables sold about $100 million in property and lots, building permits in 1925. Miami Shores, which was a brand new community, only created late 1924, sold about $75 million in property lots in 1925. And of course, there was all kinds of flipping of real estate, and I wanted to share with you a couple of quotes. A man named John Jackson Bennett, a longtime Miami resident, was reminiscing years later about the boom, and he said, and I quote, everything went kind of crazy. I'd leave home in the morning and tell my wife, how much money do you want me to bring home? I'd come uptown, and it wasn't too long for, I'd have a deposit on a piece of property maybe a few hundred dollars, in 48 hours you'd sell it and make several thousand dollars. And these stories go on and on and on. And then of course, there came the inevitable bust for a host of reasons. The FEC Railway said, we're not bringing any more cargo in because our tracks are so beat up because we're carrying so much cargo. So we're gonna put a moratorium on the delivery of any goods from April 17, 1925 until the early part of the next year, except if there are medical goods, everything else falls. So you didn't have the construction materials to feed this boom, and that's what makes this speculation real when you begin to see the, the physical dimensions of it. Also, a boat sunk in Miami's turn basement, right where the cruise ships today. The cruise ships today typically will move in a northwesterly direction as they're getting ready to come through the government cut and out into deep water and onto their journeys. That's a turn basement there. It was created way back in the early 1900s. A ship sunk in January 1926, right in that turn basin, which meant that no other ships could come in or out because they were closed off the base very shallow otherwise. And that was a factor, I think, in the bust. And then there was a new federal income tax policy, which said that when somebody sold a piece of real estate, this was an attempt to slow down the speculation, they had to pay taxes on the, not what they got for a down payment, but the entire value of that transaction. And this really kind of discouraged a lot of people from continuing to do this. And then there was a lot of opposition from northern states. Uh, Northern states began to send out propaganda. You don't want to go down there and pull all the money out of the banks like you're doing here. Uh, because people down there are just going to take it away from you. It's a flim flam operation. And there was a lot of pressure from Northern states about people taking money out. And there was bad publicity, just in general. Publicity that somebody said, and this became part of it, seemed like the conventional wisdom, to get a haircut in downtown Miami at the peak of the boom would cost you something like $20 which for them was exorbitant. Today it's a pretty good deal. And so it was all over by the summer of 1926, and then that mighty hurricane smashed into the area in September, and again the area entered its own version of the Great Depression three years before the rest of the nation. The 1930s, population growth and surging tourism in the second half of the 30s uh, brought another building boom, especially on Miami Beach, especially on South Beach, and a little later on what we call Mid Beach, up to maybe 40th Street. And the boom then was manifest most dramatically there. In fact, there were over a thousand hotels and apartments built in South Beach and a part of what I would call Mid Beach between 1935 and the end of 1941. So we had another boom at that time. And of course, this was a boom where the buildings were designed primarily what we call streamlined wood yard or art deco style of architecture. And um, other parts of the county also experienced some big building uh, trends at that time. The Rhodes neighborhood in Miami and Carl Gables, and they're bringing in this whole new style, this streamlined modern, this Art Deco. Uh, and it's interesting that Miami Beach, despite the fact that its population in 1940 was only 28,000 plus, that is a Brona population, uh, it was in the last half of the 40s each year, 
last April 30th, 1935, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, and 41, among the top 10 cities in the United States in the issuance of building permits, even though it was a very small city in terms of its permanent population. And so you might wonder, what did all this? What brought this boom on Miami Beach? Well, it was triggered by a surge in tourism and an economy that began to improve pretty sharply in America in 1938, 39, 40, and 41. Also, a joint promotion. For example, if you came down here, and they were really pitching the middle class as much as anybody, uh, get on the American plan. The American plan means that you can rent a hotel room on South Beach very inexpensively, and meals would build into the whole ticket. And I think another reason why there was a boom in construction, because of course the boom was answering the surge in tourism, the surge in demand, was the fact that a lot of unionized workers were now getting paid vacations for the first time. And in fact, this was a high point of the unionization of labor. Steel and automobile manufacturing, for example, were unionized at the end of the 1930s. So you had a lot of people coming down who hadn't been here before. And to meet this tremendous demand, all of these buildings went up. And they were moderately priced in terms of construction. When you look at an Art Deco building, it's a rectangular building with a wonderful facade. But it's a very humble building otherwise. And then there was a the post-World War II boom. And although the war marked a halt, and that's what closed that boom of the 1930s was the war itself, Although it marked a halt in non-military construction, it introduced hundreds of thousands of men and women to this area as military trainees. Many got, as Damon Runyon wrote, sand in their shoes and returned to Greater Miami as new residents after the war. And the stories are just legion about this. I mean, if you're out doing basic training on South Beach in January and you come from New Jersey, you just can't believe this is going on. You got the water there, the temperature is 72. I mean, this is unreal. People came back in droves. I think one of the most interesting stories, I've written a lot of histories of Fort Lauderdale and Broward. Uh, there were so many people coming to Fort Lauderdale, which was much smaller than Miami, that there was no room to put them up. And these were essentially homeless people, other than the fact that there were still these military barracks on Fort Lauderdale Beach. And that's where this drove of people lived until they could get into apartments and houses. And there was such a dearth of buildings for this onslaught of people. Well, this expansive period following World War II really represents one of the most buoyant eras in American economic history. The prosperity was triggered throughout America by unprecedented consumer spending. Millions of Americans, for instance, purchased their first homes, their first automobiles. Florida benefited from this prosperity, I think, as much as any state in the country. Some characteristics of this expansion post-World War II that went on for a lengthy period of time. There was a soaring population growth in Florida in greater Miami, in the nation as a whole. And that growth was accompanied by a real estate boom. You gotta put these people up somewhere, they gotta live somewhere. There was the explosive growth of suburbia for the first time. There were record numbers of winter visitors and that led to the construction of hotels like the Fountain Blue and the Dolito and the Sun Souci and the Saxony and it just goes on and on and on. And the figures really buttress this. For example, Florida grew by 72% in the 1940s. That was the highest percentage of growth of any state with a population of one million or more. Greater Miami, in the same period, grew by 87% in terms of population between 1940 and 1948, marking it as the fastest growing metropolitan area east of the Rocky Mountains. Furthermore, Greater Miami was fourth among American municipalities in the number of dwelling units built in 1947. While well, Florida was third among states in the same statistical area. How about this? So the following year, 1948, Dade County, as it was called then, led all metropolitan areas in the United States in the numbers of new dwellings under construction, with 171 stars per thousand families. Let's look at the expansion uh, through, I think, another lens, and that is Florida Power and Light. I wrote a history of it a couple of years ago. And you can imagine how overwhelmed they were by all these new construction starts. In 1946, the total operating revenues of this Miami-based utility, FPNL, were $26 million. By 1955, operating revenues had reached $93 million. The annual revenue growth was in double figures for FPNL for nearly every year between 1946 and 1960. Again, though, by 60, the company has spread way beyond Dade County, but nevertheless, it's based to a large degree right here. In subsequent decades, 
After the early post-war boom, the real estate boom bus cycle continued to characterize the economy of Miami, South Florida, and other portions of the Sunshine State through recent times. More specifically, the explosive growth of suburbia, first evident with GI developments in the decade following the conclusion of the war and after, radically transformed Greater Miami, bringing into play areas that had been swampland just a handful of years before and or dairy farms prior to that time. By the 1960s, the county's residential, institutional, retail development pushed out its corporate borders on all sides. And the building boom that we've been talking about since the end of the war only slowed briefly in the late 1950s. There was a, a mild recession, and again in the early 1960s, there was another mild recession. Other than that, building was really the order of the day throughout the area for all those decades. Uh, and it continued, almost unchecked, until the Arab oil boycott of the fall of 1973, which really slowed down everything in the economy. In fact, an economic recession, a very severe one, was underway by 1974-75. As one Florida Power and Light official observed in terms of that Arab oil boycott, and I quote, he said, the world turned upside down in October of 1973, end quote. And then there's the recent past. Recent decades have brought explosive development to the Brickell Avenue neighborhood, which was heavily residential until that time, single family homes as well as the West Kendall, which had been swamp land and undeveloped land up until that time, as well as the extreme northern reaches of Miami-Dade County. The boom of the late 1970s, early 1980s marked the moment when the city skyline took off. Financing for money of the more spectacular buildings along Brickell Avenue, many designed by Architect Tonica, uh, as well as elsewhere, was allegedly fueled by drug money, which is an allegation that's difficult to prove. For one of the first times, Foreign investment, primarily from the southern parts of this hemisphere, became very important in understanding these booms. The downturn that followed was mild, that would be by the, sometime in the 1980s, was mild when compared with the past real estate boom bust eras. Um, and then, once again, by the late 1980s, things picked up very dramatically in terms of development. How about the millennial booms, the booms of not just today, but the more recent, the the recent one right after the turn of the century. The boom that began in 2002 and lasted for more than four years was the most spectacular speculative construction period since that of the 1920s. And was again, I think, assisted by the following characteristics. Heavy foreign investment, a booming national economy, easy lending policies by the banking industry as we all know. It differed that millennial boom beginning in 2002. It differed from early booms because its focus was Miami's urban core, defined as the area from Brickell Avenue neighborhood in the south, Rickenbacker Causeway entrance at 26th Road, all the way up a little bit past the Julia Tuttle Causeway entrance at Northeast 36th Street. And its symbol was a towering condominium complex. Even with its central focus on the Brickell downtown corridor, other areas, including those along the Miami River and far away Sunny Isles were also impacted by the proliferation of towering condominiums. The city of Miami, as a result of that boom, now possessed the third densest skyline in the United States after New York City and Chicago. The bust that followed in, 19, in 2007 was as severe as any before, and it was exacerbated, of course, by a frightening national recession, the so-called Great Recession, as empty towers dotted the city skyline in those years after that bus set in in 2008. Again, Greater Miami was set up for a long-term downturn, but increasing condominium sales, many of the Latin American investors brought back the speculative fever. Today, a contemporary boom which got underway in 2011, 2012, represents another high-rise assault, as it were, on the city of Miami's core areas. It too owes much of its activity to foreign investment but also to domestic investment, fueled by the growing image of Miami and the beaches as one of the most beguiling regions of the United States. But this boom was picked up where the previous boom left off in terms of keying in on the center city, and even evidence in itself in neighborhoods like along the banks of the Miami River, Little Havana, Wynwood, Buena Vista Design District, that had not seen development of this magnitude ever in their history. So this boom that we're experiencing right now has as one of its offshoots then the revitalization and gentrification
with all the freight that comes along with that, and sometimes a lot of controversy, uh, of older neighborhoods. The focus seems to be more on the central core, and that, of course, is part of a national trend. So I'm going to leave it at this.